And now onto our dinosaur of the day, Sauralophus, which was a request from PaleoMike716 via our Patreon and Discord, so thanks. It was a hadrosaurid that lived in the late Cretaceous in what is now Alberta, Canada, and Mongolia in the Horseshoe Canyon Formation and Nemet Formation is where it's been found. And it's two different species. It's one of the few dinosaurs known from more than one continent. It looks similar to Parasaurolophus with the bulky body, it could walk on all fours, and it had a long horse-shaped head and a long tail, but the crest was different. The crest was smaller and spike-like, and it curved upwards at the back. And it goes up and back at about a 45-degree angle and then sticks out behind the skull. Yeah, it's kind of typical of the Lampiosaurians. Most of their head crests kind of go up. Parasaurolophus is kind of a weird one where it actually kind of goes down at the back. Yeah. Now, the crest is mostly solid, but it had a hollow base where it attached to the skull. And the crest is made of its nasal bones. The longest skull bones in Sauralophus are the nasal bones. Also known as the premaxilla. Mm-hmm. Which is sort of the top front of the beak, too. So it's almost like the beak growing all the way back over the <laughs> back of the head. <laughs> like Sometimes I imagine them like slicking back their hair, but like maybe like a mustache a going mustache. all the way back. <laughs> <laughs> That's an interesting way of thinking of it. <laughs> the crest also grew as it aged, which makes sense. Based on its scleral rings that have been found, Sauralophus may have been cathomeral, so active throughout the day for short periods of time. It was also herbivorous, and it could walk on all fours or on two legs. It had a horseshoe-shaped lower jaw that wrapped around the toothless parts of the jaw to form a beak. And it cropped plants with its beak. It also had those dental batteries with hundreds of teeth, and those teeth were just being constantly replaced. So it could grind its food, almost like chewing. And it could eat food that was up to 13 feet or 4 meters above the ground. That's pretty good. Yeah. The type species is Sauralophus osborni, and the genus name means lizard crest. It was named by Barnum Brown in 1912. As I mentioned, there are two species. The second species is Sauralophus angustirostris. And that one was described in 1952 by Anatoly Rozdzvensky. Brown found the Sauralophus osborni fossils in 1911, and it was the first nearly complete dinosaur skeleton found in Canada at the time. Wow. Yeah, three Sauralophus osborni specimens have been found, including a virtually complete skull and skeleton. The holotype of Sauralophus osborni was mounted on a panel behind glass, and you can see the right side of the animal at the American Museum of Natural History, which we've seen that one. Is it one of the ones that's sort of mounted vertically? Vertically? Like on a wall, basically? Oh, yes. Yeah, and behind glass. I feel like it's near the Ankylosaurus, and that's why I might remember it. <laughs> I don't remember where exactly it was, <laughs> but I was looking at pictures. I mean, it's an Ornithischian, so it's probably near it, because they have like the hall of Ornithischians and the mm. hall of Sauruschians. For the other species, the Russian paleontological expedition went to the Gobi Desert in 1947, and that was led by I.A. Efremov. And they found a hadrosaur bone bed. And later they said that this was Sauralophus angusterostris. And that bone bed is known as Dragon's Tomb. There's so many well preserved and articulated skeletons in Dragon's Tomb, which unfortunately has made it a favorite spot for poachers. Mm. Sauralophus is about 20% of the fossils found in the Nemet formation. Holy cow. Yeah. I had no idea it was that many. I didn't either until I started researching this dinosaur. I never think of hadrosaurs in the Nemec formation. Yeah, me either. <laughs> There's so many other dinosaurs. I think of ankylosaurs, little alvarosaurs. Ornithomimosaurs. And sauropods. I think of the sauropods. There's also therizinosaurus, troodontids, allosaurs, but I've never thought of hadrosaurs there. <laughs> <laughs> Although looking it up, there are multiple. Yeah. So there's at least 15 specimens known for Sauralophus angusterostris. In 1930, Ryabinin named a third species, Sauralophus christavophysi. That's my best guess at how that's pronounced, but that's no longer considered to be valid. It was based on part of a hip that was found from Heilongjiang province, China, but it's too fragmentary and it had been compared to an isolated but complete ischium that was later found to be Hippacrosaurus. 
So that's why it's not considered valid. Also in 2013, Albert Prieto Marquez and Jonathan Wagner named Sauralophus morrisi, but that's now considered to be Augustinolophus, which is the state dinosaur of California. So we've talked about that one a lot. That points out something important because that's a different Sauralophus species, which got split out into its own genus. And when you were saying how this Sauralophus is on multiple continents, but they're different species, mm -hmm. that could always happen. They could always say the Sauralophus that's in Asia is different than the one that's in North America, and then they'd have different genus names again, like happened to Augustinolophus. Yes. But for now, it's the same genus and then two different species. It would be unfortunate for California if Augustinolophus went back to Sauralophus since it's been named the <laughs> state dinosaur, then our state dinosaur would just be Sauralophus, which would seem not that impressive. Yeah. Or at least unique. It's a cool dinosaur, though. I don't think it'll go back, but only time will tell for sure. Mm hmm. Now, Brown thought when he was describing Sauralophus, he thought that Sauralophus and Trachodon were similar and related. And he also compared the crest of Sauralophus to that of a chameleon's. He thought it'd be a good spot where muscles attached and then connected to a frill in the back of the head like a basilisk lizard. Oh, that's a fun idea. Also, sort of like the Dilophosaurus in Jurassic Park. Yeah. Because they have that kind of frill that like shoots out of their neck. Parasaurolophus having a huge one attached to its crest yeah. or Sauralophus having a huge one attached to its crest would be really interesting. Brown said the crest is, quote, the most characteristic and striking feature of the skull. That's for sure. Mm-hmm. Peter Dodson thought the crest was used for identifying if the animal was male or female. Could be. Could be. There's a lot of theories on the crest. In 1981, Marianska and Osmolska suggested the crest was used for thermoregulation. James Hobson thought that the crest was for display and suggested that there were inflatable skin flaps over the nostrils as well. <laughs> so, could be frill on the back, inflatable nostrils, sacks on the front. Yep. All of the above. Animals like turkeys and stuff have all sorts of <laughs> ornamentation around their heads. So, so <laughs> why not both? It's, it's something that's really hard to decipher. For sure, display had to be a factor, even if it wasn't the primary reason. When you got something that big mm -hmm. on the top of the head, it's got to be used for display a little bit. Probably. So like I said, there's now two valid species of Sauralophus, Osborni and Angusterostris. Both species have the same head crests and a lot of other similarities. So in the past, scientists questioned if both species were valid, kind of going the other way from what you were saying, Garrett. That would be more lumping. <laughs> making yeah. them the same species even and same genus rather than different genus. Yes. But then in 2011, Phil Bell redescribed both species in two different papers, and he found them to be both distinct and valid and said that each of them had their unique characters, and these unique characters weren't just due to individual variations. So it's not just different individuals look a little bit different. It's these are features known for these species. It'd be remarkable if in the late Cretaceous you had animals in Asia and North America that were the same exact species. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Unless they could swim across the Pacific. Oh, that's such a long <laughs> swim. Or I guess the Atlantic and walk through Europe. So there are some differences. There's differences in the size. Like Sauralophus osborni was estimated to be about 27 to 28 feet or 8.2 to 8.5 meters long and weigh about 3 tons with a skull that was about 3.3 .3 feet or 1 meter long. Sauralophus angusterostris is estimated to be up to 43 feet or 13 meters long and possibly even bigger and weigh up to 11 tons. Wow, that's a really big size difference. Yeah. But by weight, that's like almost four times the size. It also had a 20% longer skull than Osborni, and the front of its snout went more upward than Sauralophus Osborni. The largest known Sauralophus angusterostris skull is about four feet or 1.2 meters long. That's really big, especially considering it had a smaller crest than Parasaurolophus. Yeah. They also found differences in the details of the skull between the two species. It's unclear which species came first. So yeah, did they start in Asia or did they start in North America? Mm -hmm. We don't know. In 2012, Phil Bell studied the skin impressions of both species, which were found on multiple individuals. There's skin from the face of Sauralophus osborni that's known from a single fragment from a right dentary in the lower jaw. 
There was no skin found on a Sorolophus osborni forelimb, but, quote, the entire forelimb of Sorolophus angusterostris is covered in a uniform arrangement of one to two millimeter wide pebbles, even in relatively large individuals, end quote. Those are small scales. Yeah. There was skin also found in the pelvic region of Sorolophus angusterostris, a small patch on a subadult, and skin found on part of the foot of a Sorolophus osborni. There's been skin found on the hind limb of Sorolophus angusterostris that was found in adults and subadults. And there were at least two patches of faintly preserved skin found on a juvenile Sorolophus angusterostris. No shortage of skin information on this one. Yeah. He also talked about patches of miscellaneous skin. And it's miscellaneous because it's unclear where on the body the skin came from. So there were a lot of scales that have been found, including polygonal, which range from four to six-sided. There's pebbly scales that are small and rounded, shell scales that are asymmetrical and somewhat trapezoidal in shape, and irregular scales where there's no obvious geometrical sides, (laughs) as well as shield scales that are circular and are typically flat or domed. So Bell found differences in the patterns and shapes of the scales, enough to differentiate between the two species. Oh, wow. That's the first dinosaur I've heard of where scales are used to differentiate different dinosaurs. Yeah. For one thing, we rarely find any scales. And for another thing, they're not usually that different. Yeah, exactly. But with hadrosaurs, a lot of skin's been found for hadrosaurs. That's true. Skin was also found on the tails for both species. And there are a lot of differences in the tail scales. For example, on Sorolophus osborni, the tail scales were more clustered and it may have had a more spotted coloration. Hmm. And on Sorolophus angusterostris, the scales on the tail made vertical patterns, and that may mean it had striped colors on its tail. I've never heard that either. The patterns of the scales themselves might show the pattern of the coloration. That's really cool. It is. In 2018, Phil Bell and others studied the sedimentology and taphonomy of Dragon's Tomb. Phil Bell did a lot of work on Sorolophus. Ivan A. Ephraimov's team found seven hadrosaurid skeletons lying close together when it was discovered, and it was discovered in 1948 by Pronin. They collected at least four skeletons or parts of four skeletons, but it was really hard to transport them. They had to transport them by camel because they couldn't get vehicles to the site. Mm. There's been a lot of expeditions to this site, and Dragon's Tomb, like I said, it's a bone bed. It's mostly Sorolophus angusterostris. And they've got juveniles, subadults, and adults. There's one Tyrannosaurus skeleton that was found that's probably Tarbosaurus. This bone bed was at least 21,500 square feet or 2,000 square meters. And there may have been over 100 Sorolophus skeletons in the bone bed. They estimated, the authors of the 2018 paper estimated the minimum number of Sorolophus individuals in the bone bed to be 21. And this could show gregarious or social behavior of Sorolophus angusterostris. 21 individuals is a lot. Yes. Although I always have to caveat, just because they died together doesn't mean they lived together. Yeah. At the very least, it is evidence of a catastrophic mass death. They were all killed and buried rapidly. That's for sure. Otherwise, it wouldn't fossilize. Yes. <laughs> and based on the skeletons being well-preserved and complete, it's likely this bone bed happened because of a flood or multiple floods that happened quickly in days to weeks in one year. Although we did see that paper recently where they were showing how dinosaurs could be left out and have that thing where they get like pierced and then the fluids get drained out and all that, and then they could be preserved without being buried quickly. That's true. So that's always a possibility. There's one left arm of a nearly complete Sorolophus angusterostris that had heavy damage from bite marks. The rest of the skeleton, though, was fine. So they think that a Tyrannosaurus scavenged the arm, possibly Tarbosaurus. Or one of the other Tyrannosaurus that were around. Mm. (laughs) There were a lot of meat-eating dinosaurs in that area. In the paper, they said, quote, unfortunately, the reliability of this locality for yielding beautiful and complete specimens of Sorolophus Angusterostris has made it a target of illegal fossil poachers, and in recent years, untold numbers of specimens have been illegally plundered and or destroyed. Oh, quote. that's a bummer. Yes. I was kind of hoping, since it's a hadrosaur and they're not as popular of a display piece as something like a tyrannosaur, mm-hmm. maybe it wouldn't happen. 
but I guess it was in such good shape. And they were really big. Yeah. So the poaching, they figured out, started sometime after 2001. In 2015, Leonard Diwale and others described a small partial nest of Sorolophus angusterostris that probably came from the dragon's tomb in the Nemet Formation. It's unclear where exactly these fossils came from because they were poached and then they ended up in Japan by way of a collector from Europe. And then it was donated to the Royal Belgian Institute of Natural Sciences, which repatriated the fossils to Mongolia. And they're now at the Institute of Paleontology and Geology of the Mongolian Academy of Sciences. Yeah, we see that a lot with poached things. Even if they get back in a museum, a lot of times that information about where they came from is lost Mm -hmm. and they're not as useful scientifically, unfortunately. Yeah, although this one's still very useful. In the paper, they said that there were three, maybe four babies and two fragmentary eggshells in the block that they prepared. Wow. And these babies were considered to be perinates. They're just born because the length of their skulls was less than 5% the length of the adult skulls. And their skull length's estimated to be about 2.3 inches or 6 centimeters long. Oh, little yeah. cuties. <laughs> they didn't have nasal crests. It's possible they broke off or maybe just the baby Sorolophus didn't form a crest yet. Yeah. I mean, that's often proposed that it might have been a a display structure that only the adults grew. We see that in tons of animals. In the paper, they were saying that the adult crests are so robust, it's unlikely that a crest broke off. They knew these babies were Sorolophus because the other skull bones were similar to those in an adult Sorolophus. And they had the upwardly directed snouts like an adult. The eggshell fragments that were found look similar to other eggs associated with more basal hadrosauroids. The reason they think there's three, maybe four individuals is based on the arm bones that they found. They said the babies were probably close to each other and nest bound when they died. It's unclear if they had just hatched or were still in the eggs when they died, but they were dead and partly decomposed when they were buried by river sediment. Yeah, that's what the perinate doesn't necessarily mean that they were hatched. They could have been just before hatching too. Exactly. There's a partially articulated skeleton there that includes the skull, neck vertebrae, part of the tail, the right leg, and more. And then the rest of the bones are disarticulated. And that suggests that some of the perinates were more decomposed than others. They studied the sediments that were surrounding the fossils and found that they were buried by river sediment probably during the wet summer season. And they probably died within a relatively short interval. The fragile bones, they're really well preserved and having a partially articulated skull shows that the bones weren't moved very far from before they were buried. Yeah, that really sounds like the whole nest just got buried and fossilized. Yeah. And again, they didn't have that spike-like crest. So it's likely that the crest grew as Sorolophus grew up. And then as it grew, Sorolophus, the snout also grew proportionally longer. And the media, Ducky from Land Before Time is probably a Sorolophus, though apparently there's some debate around this. <laughs> Ducky does have a cute little point at the back of her skull, so that makes sense. Yeah. In the 1997 Land Before Time sing-along songs video, Ducky is a Sorolophus. And like you were saying, Ducky's head crest looks like the head crest of a Sorolophus. I never put that together before. <laughs> I always thought they were just giving it a cute little, you know, cow lick basically oh. the back of the head i think i knew and then i saw a post recently saying ducky's a parasaurolophus and in my brain i was like that doesn't make sense because of the crest <laughs> yeah <laughs> but yeah ducky has been portrayed inconsistently in the series because uh well apparently the land before time website which no longer exists called ducky both trachodon and parasaurolophus and in merch ducky's labeled as parasaurolophus Yeah, but those are like a lot of times other companies or whatever that are just sort of hired to do a specific thing that probably don't know all the lore of Land Before Time Mm. as well as the writers who are making the musicals. I don't know, but I think this has sparked debate about it. Yeah. You could make the argument, oh, it's a parasaurolophus and the crest just hasn't grown that much yet. You could, but the way it is shaped. Mm -hmm. I'm with you. I'm going with (laughs) sorolophus. Well, as to where Sorolophus lived, in the Horseshoe Canyon Formation, other dinosaurs that lived around the same time and place as Sorolophus osborni included the Ornithopods, Hippacrosaurus and Parxosaurus, the Ankylosaur and Odontosaurus, the Pachycephalosaur, Spherotholus, the Ornithomimid, Ornithomimus, the Theropods, Atrociraptor and Albertonychus. 
and the larger theropod Tyrannosaurid albertosaurus. That's a lot of animals. Yeah. In the Nemet formation with Sauralophus angusterostris, there were streams and rivers and shallow lakes and other dinosaurs that lived around the same time and place, included the Hadrosaurid barsbolia, the Pachycephalosaurs, Homolocephaly and Prenocephaly, the Ankylosaur Cycania, the Titanosaurs Nemetosaurus and Apistocelicaria, the Alvarosaur Mononychus, Troodontids such as Xanabazar, Ovaraptorosaurs including Nemetomaya, Ornithomimosaurs like Gallimimus, theropods like Dinochirus and Therizinosaurus, and then the larger theropod Tyrannosaurid Tarbosaurus. So many good dinosaurs in the Demect formation. Oh, yeah. And Sauralophus is one of them. Yeah. Well, no longer overlook it. <laughs> Try to remember that it's in that mix. <laughs> but when Dinochirus and Therizinosaurus and Tarbosaurus, it's, it's hard to stand out. For those of you who listen to our Dinosaur of the Day segment and you like it, please consider becoming a patron. We take new Dinosaur of the Day requests from our patrons and offer a bunch of other perks as well. So check out our page at patreon.com slash I know dino or click the link on the left.